All right. So for lab eight, um, we're going to kind of bring everything that we've done from labs six and seven together in kind of this culminating thing. And in fact, there was a time when labs six, seven, and eight were all a single lab, but they've split them up. Um, and because of that, lab eight is kind of like the last steps because we've done a lot of little pieces and this is kind of where we tie it all together to bring it home per se. So I just kind of want to talk a little bit about uh, what the what we're actually going to be doing. So first off, let's start with, we're, I'm just going to go through the lab and talk about the business logic behind it all. So that way, hopefully it makes a little bit of sense. So step eight, if you remember back, or sorry, step one, I saw the eight points and we're on lab eight, but in step one, um, or in step four of lab seven, that very last thing that you did before this lab is we wrote that big query that would gather all of the price data. <clears throat> you know, it pulled 135 rows um, and we, we had all this price data. You know, we had every item and it's per current price and at any historical price if it was an old movie. Um, and so what we're going to do in this first bit is we are going to um, this step one is we're actually going to insert that data. Um, and it gives you some hints here. It says you should already have a price uh, sequence um, and you should use the price X next price. And this should say S1 or whatever you have your price sequence called. You're going to use the next value to populate the price ID. Um, and then it tells you how to pull the subquery, um, which we've done lots. Um, but it kind of just gives you that again. But this is the format that we're going to use. Um, and so we wrote in our last query, we wrote this piece right here. Um, it clear down to right here. So this is where we wrote our query. So basically, you can actually just take and copy this whole thing. And just replace the stuff that you need to right there because this should have, let's see, there's a parenthesis, there's a parenthesis. So this parenthesis, it actually goes over to this one. So you're going to get everything but that last parenthesis and you're just going to paste your lab seven here. Um, but you want to make sure that it has the correct names because, you know, basically you want it to match this um, and as amount and all that kind of stuff because it needs to match what's right here. And basically, we wrap it in all this stuff so that way we can uh, do the insert. Because you'll notice what it, what we're doing is we have our normal insert into price. And then instead of specifying the values manually, which would be crazy, we're, we're going to just pull straight from a select statement. So we're going to insert from the select statement. But that means our, in, our select statement has to match. So you'll notice the first thing in our select statement is the price sequence next val that goes into our price id item id price type so on and so forth because this is what we're selecting and then this is actually kind of an outer select um, the inner select is actually right here um, where we're going to be have all of our stuff so you just need to make sure that your your columns that you're selecting that they they line up for one you know you want to make sure item id is the first one and then active flag is the price type or active flag. So there's a little, little weirdness there. So you might need to flop those. There's a hint. You might need to flop those because we want to make sure those all match up right because those ones are backwards. Um, so you want to make sure they all line up and then you might wear like this one. You, you'll notice that this says common lookup ID, but then it says as price type. And that's because when we say select price type from our statement, it's going to use this as, so we can say select price type, and this is actually the common lookup ID. So it shouldn't be too crazy um, because we they give you most of the stuff there. And you should end up with something very close to this, which uh, tells you how many new and old movies you have. Prices, I guess you should say, prices. All right, and, and so that's basically just inserting into our price table, which is which is pretty sweet. Um, and then finally, um, now that we actually have prices in there, we add the not null constraint to the price type column of the price table, which we've done that quite a bit to, you know, alter table, boom, you just uh, add that constraint. Um, and then on step three, 
Um, step three is where now that we have the prices, we are going to um, update the rest of our, our table. So for example, rental item, which basically what we're going to do is we have all these people who we've already rented movies to. And so essentially what we're going to do is we are going to backdate all of those records and assign them a price based on how many days they rented it and the item. Um, so just to give you a little idea here what this does. Um, but one little notice is that you'll want to fix something in here, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But I want to really explain this query because it does some pretty awesome stuff. Um, but you just got to take it piece by, by piece. So I like to read it somewhat like this. So we're updating rental item, obviously, and we are going to set the rental item price values. So we're basically going to iterate through rental item and we're going to go through all of the rental item price, which are currently all empty, but we're going to go through and we're going to assign those. And how do we assign those? And this is where it gets a little, it can look a little confusing. But if we look at this, we're selecting the price, the amount from price, right? So pretty simple. If we see a doll, you know, we see the amount in our price table, that's what we're going to pull, but we have to match that. So um, based on how many days they rented the movies and whatnot. So then we do an inner join to common lookup on the price type equals the common lookup ID. So basically we take our prices and we align those based on the one day, three day, five day rentals because that's our price type. And then we cross join that with rental R and cross join that with common lookup. And this is where it's a little confusing, um, but the reason why we do cross joins to rental and then cross joins to common lookup is so we have, basically we're building every possible combination. And the reason being is because then we're gonna filter them out after. So basically we build every possible combination of rental and common lookup, and then we're gonna start filtering. And this is, this is where we start to filter. So once we have everything here, we're gonna make sure that the item's the same, right? We wanna make sure the movie is the right price. Then we wanna make sure that we're talking about the same rental. So the same rental that's in rental item is the same rental for rental table. We wanna make sure that we're talking apples to apples and we're not crisscrossing people's transactions. Then we wanna make sure that the rental item type which is our one day, three day, and five day rental um, is equal to the common lookup ID. And we still have a few matches there. So then we filter that additionally and we check to see common lookup one, which remember it's right up here because we already have that connected to price. So then we check and make sure that the common lookup code, which is our one, three, and five is uh is matching between the price table and now our rental rental item combination common lookup code so that's basically what we're doing here is we're connecting our common lookup two which is going to be for the rental item one day three day five day rental to our price rent one day three day five day rental because if we go look at our common lookup table they're both two different things um and then our the last and most important bit here is we need to make sure, basically we're going to figure out what the active price was when they rented the movie. And we remember we talked about this last time where, you know, we could go through and find exactly how much an item cost for any date in the history of our database, just by looking at the start date and end date of price. Because in this case, we're going to do exactly that. And so we look and say, okay, when did they check out their rental? And then we say, okay, well, what was the price during that time? So we say between P dot start date and P dot end date, because that's when it's active. So the checkout date will be between a price start date and end date. Now there is one little catch here. Um, and, and if we were to go look at our price table um, at this point, if you remember right, some prices didn't have an end date. And so here's a question I'm going to pose is how do we know if I were to say, oh, is your birth date between 
March 1st, 20, 2003 and null. Basically, the computer's going to throw a fit because this can be null. And so there's, there's a little trick you can do. Um, there's that is null function. And, and if you look in, if you just go up to McLaughlin's website, you can actually, and I believe we've used this before, but you can actually just search for is null here. Um, and let's see right here or null value. So un underneath that first result, there'll be a null value functions. And this is uh, something that's really important. If you take a look, and the reason I said is null is because if we look at SQL Server, it's is null. Um, but in Oracle, we have this NVL function, which basically allows us to replace a null value with something. So for example, if we were to run this one, you'll notice that basically the first parameter is the one we're testing. And so if we have something here, then it's going to return something. So if we were to run this, it actually is going to say something. And in fact, let's just go ahead and give that a shot here real quick. So if I were to run this, um, you're, it, it's going to say something. But the, mean, the minute that I change that something to null, then it's going to return nothing. So essentially what we, were, what we would do is we would say select nvl um, p.endDate. And then we might want to put something like a, something like that maybe. Because this way, if p dot end date is empty, it's going to replace it with tomorrow. So just as a heads up, you might want to take a look at something like that for there, because that will be uh, it'll throw an error as is. But if you uh, put the null value function around that end date, you're going to have a lot better results. And you know, I've always thought this was kind of funny. Um, if you look right here, if you want a good example in the validation statement, it actually uses the same, same logic. So if you take a look here, um, that's a little hint. All right, and then you should end up with this. Now, this is where we're gonna get into the meat of this because if you look step four, which is the last one, it's just add a not null constraint, which we've done a million times as well. Not a million, but we've done it a lot. Um, so I'm going to be honest and say that the majority of your work, because steps one through three are going to go pretty easy until you have, unless you have a problem, which that's what, uh, that's really what this lab, why it's so light as far as work is because this is, like I said, this is the kind of the culmination of, of our last two labs. And so any issues with your last two labs is most likely going to manifest right here. So, um, as part of step three, there's this detailed problem solving uh, step. And, and I wanna talk about this and you wanna make sure you read this cause it's gonna give you some clues. So for example, the first one, and these are not part of the lab. If everything goes smoothly, you don't even have to touch these. But if something doesn't show up right, this is where you wanna look. Um, and basically we can verify that uh, certain little bits of data. So the first bullet point is we're gonna check our contacts and our memberships. Um, and I like to call this kind of census data with a membership included because it's kind of just telephone contact names and that kind of stuff. So basically we check our contacts to make sure that they're all connected properly um, because specifically we want them all on the same like account number. Basically this one, most likely everyone's going to have this down pat. The next one is our uh, checks our rentals. Um, so this is going to go through and check all of the rentals that our people have and their rental items. So just like in the instructions we did in lab six, um, Harry has two rentals, Ginny has one and Lily Luna has one. 
Um, so this is just to help you kind of make sure you have all the data there. Now, this one is probably the most important one um, because most, like I said, most likely you're going to have those. This step is important because it's going to tell you how many um, foreign key counts there are in these because basically this is the one where uh, most people don't have something set up right. Um, and this one actually is all based on that step three of this, this lab when we, when we do this step right here because that's what's going to connect all those. Um, you can see here that we have our price type and common lookup type. And I'm going to show you actually one of the most common um, mistakes um, that people do. All right. And then the last one is going to be our, um, this last one's tricky because you're used to running it and then you'd want to expect to see this. But if you look at this, um, it says the most common error occurs when you insert the wrong start date in the price table. The following query will help you see that type of error. So all, every term I get people that run this and say, oh, I'm not getting any rows because they expect to see this. But this one, you don't want to get rows. So it says you made the mistake if the start date occurs after the rental start date like the rows here. Um, and so this one, if you get rows here, those are the broken rows. So you actually want to get an, if you run this and get an empty result set, that's actually good. Now, this isn't going to find all your errors, but it's a great start. It'll help you pinpoint where something's going wrong because then we can reverse engineer in this kind of stuff. Um, and like I said, step four is just adding a not null constraint. So this lab should actually be fairly straightforward. And based on what I saw in lab six, and unfortunately I haven't had the chance to get to lab seven yet, um, I believe this should go pretty quick for most people um, because most people are right on track. And realistically, uh, most of the error prone stuff was actually in lab six. So there's only a couple things in lab seven that can goof up and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So. Um, let's jump into that now because we've kind of beat up the instructions. Like I said, they're pretty straightforward. I, I really think this is actually one of the easier labs of the course, especially if you're, if your labs are error free and were all done properly prior to this lab, it's going to go super, super easy. All right. So one thing that I wanted to show you real quick, that's probably one of the more common issues and I've kind of broken mine um, just to show you. So I'm actually going to run my apply Oracle lab eight here and I have intentionally broken uh, portions of my database um, to simulate as if something were broken. So that way we can, that way we can see what's, what's uh, going to, what's going on. Oh, and I guess I just unbroke it with this because I didn't actually put it in the code. Um, so this is actually all worked properly, but um, let's see, because I forgot to take out the call. So let's re-break it. And I guess I'll talk about it as we go along. Um, but real quick, let me open up my lab eight so we can turn off the call to the previous lab. There we go. Let's break that. So that way it uh, doesn't do that again. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call lab seven. All right, and like I said, like we talked about, you should end up with these 135 rows. And again, just to reiterate, you'll notice that the end date many of them are missing. All right, and since I, I was gonna have this be a surprise, but since I made a goof up, you'll see me break the database. So one of the more common things, if we take a look at um, our common lookup table, common lookup table is one of the more complicated uh, design methods in, this, in our database. And so a lot of people, either mess it up because they don't understand it and or have trouble have an issue troubleshooting it. 
So the one of big importance are these ones. So the ones that apply to price um, and rental item are going to be the ones that are big in lab eight, as we discussed. And in fact, let's, let's just go ahead and filter those down right here. Everything from common lookup. Where common lookup table is in price and rental item. Now, one thing that um, I noticed in, in some of the labs, I guess it helps if I spell common lookup correctly, is uh, people are not realizing the importance of capitalization. So in this case, if I am looking for common lookup table that's in all uppercase price, then it needs to be all uppercase price in my database. And a lot of people have been inserting rows. And for the most part, if you're inserting into common lookup, most of the time it's price with the exception of common lookup meaning. So unless it's common lookup meaning, it's going to be all uppercase. Um, but you can't, uh, you know, capitalize a capital P does not equal a lowercase p. So you just want to make sure to keep that in mind. If you put it in a quote, it is literal, meaning that capitalization counts. It doesn't count, you know, if I say alter or select everything from common lookup, it doesn't matter if common lookup is lowercase or uppercase. But when we put something inside of these quotes, case very much matters because it is a string literal. But anyways, back to what we were talking about. These are the records that are that are kind of important um, in this lab. And one of the most common errors that I see um, is has to deal with this common lookup code um, because it's just easy to miss when you're inserting those because if you're copying a previous common lookup insert, common lookup code isn't there. Um, and so you want to make sure you have this common lookup code because it's very important for these steps. Um, and basically, it's just a way for us to have our 135, 135, and our yes and no kind of separated out from everything else. All right, but let's take a look. So I'm actually going to break this. And so like I said, some of the most common things is to forget that common lookup code. So I'm going to update common lookup. And I'm going to set common lookup code equal to null, where common lookup code is not null. Up, oh, and I guess I need to finish type and I get way ahead of myself. There we go. And now you'll notice they're null. So you want to make sure yours looks like this up here, but just for the sake of showing you the consequences and how to troubleshoot, we're going to leave it like that. Um, one of the other big um, things that people get mistaken is right here. And like I said, this is where string literals are very important. So basically they will uh, have it written wrong. So let's update common lookup, but we're going to set common lookup type equal to, let's do the five day rental. And they'll do something like this. They'll say five day rental. They'll put like hyphens. And I know it's it's silly, um, but it happens. And it's just because, you know, you're reading lots of stuff and it's just a simple human mistake. But um, we're gonna we're gonna just demo it so you can see how to solve it. Because really it should be like this. And this again, where this, Punk, the capitalization is really important. There we go. Let's take a look now. Okay, so we're going to go like this. And you'll notice you can see that one, how it's different. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a problem for us here going in forward. So, anywho, let's, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's run our lab eight. So now let's go apply. Oracle Lab 8, because this time, because it's not going to clean up, you'll notice that we're going to get some, we're going to get some errors. So we're going to go ahead and run that. Let's, uh, let's pull open our log file here. So we're in Lab 8. We want our lab8.txt file. 
All right, so there's our insert into price and we got 135 rows created there. We're all good. That's exactly what we want. You'll notice that we get the same results from there that we wanted. A um, couple other things that we do. Um, now, here's where the problems start. Um, so you'll notice that when we get here to this update rental item step, everything's correct and it says 13 rows are updated. So you think everything's good. But then when we run the validation, we get no rows selected. And then furthermore, when we try to put our not null constraint on, we get this null values found. And that's, the, that's a problem. And so, like I said, this is kind of where most people that are going to have problems end up is right here where we're at right now. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to take those troubleshooting steps that I showed you. Um, and we're going to just start running some of these to make sure we're, we match up right. And we're going to find where our issue is. So let's, let's do this one. I'm just going to put them right in our terminal here. We have 15 rows selected. Everything looks good. All right, everything should look good there. So now we're gonna check this next one. We're gonna basically check our rental items and everything like that. So let's go ahead and paste that in there. We get our 13 rows selected. And uh-oh, we have an issue because Harry Potter isn't showing up in their rentals. So there's something we could go look for, which we know that's in lab six. So if it were me, I'm going to pull open my lab now, you know, because mine's broken on purpose. Normally you would rerun this. Get out of here. Let's move you. So we're going to open up my lab six log file here in our current directory because that's the latest one that ran. And we're going to go find where we insert our rentals for Harry Potter. So there's our insert into rental or into stuff. So right here, you'll notice that we have this issue and that's because I put it in wrong and you'll notice that it says dash day rental. Um, and that's because I broke that five day rental. So that's one. So now then we would know, oh, we need to fix that. So we would actually go to lab six where we did that and fix it. But in my case, I'm going to fix it manually. So we're just going to, probably way too far back but we're going to try it there we go we're going to fix our boo-boo here normally you would just do that in your code but we're we're going to do it there all right so we fix that let's uh let's make sure we get those back in here so let's rerun that validation oh and we still don't have it so there's still something going on there, which we would need to check out. Um, and so this is where I like to do reverse engineering. And this basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this, this statement and we're gonna piece it out and we're gonna pull one thing at a time or just look at it and, and take a look. So we know that we go from uh, member M to contact C based on the member ID. Um, which shouldn't be anything too crazy there. And we know that because our first one, our first query pulled Harry Potter. So let's make sure that I'm not lying. Yep, so we got Harry Potter there. So we know that the the join between all that's good. And so the only difference on this one is we go from rental um, based on the contact customer ID and all that fun stuff. So basically what we're going to do is we are going to um, check that our, we're going to find out where this breaks essentially. So what we're going to do is we are going to, let's put this into a text file for starters. So let's go here. We're just going to hit new. We're going to paste this in here. Because um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to comment out um, stuff that we don't need. So I'm actually going to just take out our rental item join. And we're going to look specifically just at our join to rental. We're going to take it one join at a time. And I know I've said that a lot before. Um, let's see. And I guess we need to 
we're gonna just take off the order by two because we we don't need that right now. There we go. And so we notice the potter, Harry, is still missing. And so we know, let's let's take this one step further just to verify. The minute we take off this join to rental, Harry shows up. So we know that the, the brokenness is between rental and, and uh, and contact. So where you, in this case, we would go to our, where's our lab six? Let me get rid of you now that we know where the problem is. Okay, so our lab six dot txt. We're gonna take a look at this and see what is going on. So again, we go down to where our rentals are and our inserts. So if we look here, we want to see where we insert into rental. And maybe that's just missing. All right, here we go. Insert into rental item. Okay, so here is our issue because we have, um, basically we're trying to, we, we have all of our, our inserts here. You can see where we do an insert into rental item here. So our rental item, rental item, and then we go into rental for Ginny. So basically in my lab six, I am missing an insert for, um, for Harry. So let's go into our lab six. And that one's actually a surprise. And I bet you that I just cut something instead of copied it at one point, which happens. And that's why we're gonna fix it here. So you guys get to see the, the real stuff. So we're gonna just take this insert into rental for Ginny and put it right back here. But instead of Ginny, we're going to do Harry. And I believe he does a one-day rental. So we're going to put that there. Okay, so lab six should be fixed. So now we're going to ignore that for now because normally you would rerun that and make sure it works before you move on. Um, but since I purposely broke mine, we're going to keep moving on. Um, and things will be a little bit off, but, but for the most part, they'll come back. So there was the step two, which we know after we run this should be fixed. Um, but the last thing we wanna check is our common lookup code stuff. So on the third bullet point, I'm just gonna take and copy our validation stuff. And you guys watch me break the code. So it's not gonna be a surprise that we don't get what we want, but you'll notice here that we are missing quite a bit of information and specifically our common lookup code is missing. That's why we only get the two rows. And so then we say, oh, we need to fix common lookup code. So then we would go to where we inserted that, which was in lab, when was that? It was either lab six or seven when we inserted that. Now, now mine's, mine's broken on purpose, so I can't just go fix that one because the file's actually still right. But um, you would go fix that at that point. Um, and at this point, I'm going to return on mine. And we're going to see if we get Harry Potter back. You'll notice that to make it so it didn't clean up, I just took that off um, of my, I took that library call off. All right, so now let's take a look at our log file. Um, we got our 13 rows updated and look, there you go. We get our results there and we get our table altered where we have our not null constraint. So everything's working fine now, um, thanks to our little thing. And let's rerun our validation that we just did to break it earlier. So let's rerun this one. And now you'll notice we get our 135, 135 
with our proper foreign key count. Now, as I talked about that one time, our one that shouldn't pull any rows, let's just make sure that we don't get any rows here because we actually want this to be an empty result set. And we get no rows selected, which is good because that will find broken rows. So that's exactly what we want. All right, and I think we beat this up. Uh, I know there's a lot of, the problem with troubleshooting is that, of course, I showed the most common ones, but it might be completely different this term. So if you come up with something that, you know, an error, something you don't understand, throw it in the team chat and, and we'll get you figured out. Um, because the honest truth is there's a lot of, you could have various different data. Um, and so, you know, I can show you some common things, but there might be one little typo. Um, and so you just got to, the validation queries will help you kind of find that because maybe you can see what's missing or in that one case, you know, it gives you an idea where to look. So um, does anyone have any questions? It should be a fairly straightforward lab this go round. Um, the, the hard part is, is there's not a whole lot of tricks I can show you because it's just troubleshooting if there's something that's wrong. Um, so anyways, but anyways, um, I know there's only a few of us here, so you're probably anxious to get going. So I will let you guys get going. Um, yep, all makes sense. I, and I really do. If, if everything's good, it's going to be a light week for everybody and you guys can have a nice and joy, um, nice soft week. If, if you do have problems though, or if you're not caught up, this is a great week to kind of revamp um, and and get caught up because it is a light week. And so, you know, if you're not quite done with lab seven, you know, lab seven and eight, I really think could lab eight's not much. And so, you know, as long as you review what I put on your lab six, get all up to par. Um, I'll be checking your lab sevens here soon. So make sure you get your lab seven turned in. And then you can jump right into lab eight and hopefully everything just goes smooth for you and it should be pretty quick. But anyways, thank you guys all for coming um, and good luck this week.